Thank you to our music team for helping us as we worship the Lord in song this morning. You have your Bibles. You can be looking at Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. And if you are one of our regulars, you will not believe it, but we are going to do an entire chapter this morning. A whole chapter. I told you we were going to pick up the pace, and I wasn't kidding. <laughs> Genesis chapter 5, there is an outline on the back of your bulletin if you'd like to use that to follow along this morning. Uh, I've entitled the message, Sticking Out Like a Sore Thumb. Sticking Out Like a Sore Thumb. Let's look at Genesis chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. I'll be reading this morning from the English. Created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness, after his image, and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahalalel. Kenan lived after he followed Mahalalel 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. When Mahalalel had lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahalalel lived after he fathered Jared 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he had fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, This one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. This is the word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, that on its pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add his blessing here to the reading of his word this morning. I would like to point your attention again to the back of the bulletin as you follow that uh, outline of where we're going. We are going to be stressing that you need to live godly. You need to stick out from the crowd. Stick out like a sore thumb. You say, how do you get that from this passage this morning? I'm hoping to help explain this because we've just gone through a lot of names, a lot of names that are difficult to pronounce. And then you have Jared, I suppose. (laughs) But most of these are, are, they, they can be rather complicated. And 
we don't really seem to know too much about. I mean, you have Enoch. We'll talk about him a little bit. You have Methuselah. Here's a, here's, if you ever have uh, that question come up in Bible trivia of who's the longest man to ever live, it's Methuselah, 969 years old, running in a close second to John Ritter. Who, no, just, just kidding. No, no, just teasing. But in all seriousness, what we have here is a lot of names that we don't really know that much about. But what we do know is that they stand out from some of the others that were mentioned in chapter 4 that descended from Cain, even descended from Adam, but the other ones that he doesn't mention. It is significant because this is Noah's generation. This is actually going to also help us understand where ultimately Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, descends from. But it also helps us to remember they stand out because of things like it says about Enoch. He walked with God. That these people, as it says at the end of chapter 4, at that time people began to call upon the name of the Lord. These people were of the lineage that showed that they had a dependence and a reliance and a relationship with God. That is what gave Noah his godly heritage. That is what God used so that, as it says in the next chapter, that Noah found favor. Noah found grace in verse 8 of chapter 6 in the eyes of the Lord because of the truth that had been invested in him because of the things that had been taught to him. And we learn from this that this happens because they are proclaiming God's truth. And we'll see that happen for us here in just a moment. But it is the reality that God, that God that they are proclaiming, is the one who is also going to bring relief. And that is the first point on your outline as you're following that outline on the back of your worship guide this morning. God brings relief. And he brings relief, number one, from the reality of death. As we read through the passage, you heard that word several times that it would talk, starting with Adam, about how Adam lived this many years after he fathered Seth, and then what happens? It's the first time that a natural death occurs. It is the prophecy fulfilled of what God told them was going to happen in the garden after they left, that you should expect in chapter 3 and verse 19, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Now we've had death, obviously. Cain had taken the life of his brother Abel. Cain had murdered his brother. And that is the reality of death inflicted on somebody. But that is not what God foretold would happen. This, what we read about in Genesis chapter 5, what happened to Adam, was what God was talking about. You are taken from the ground. You are going to return. When I do a funeral, especially usually at the graveside, I will quote a phrase that is taken, lifted from these verses. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. That's not taken explicitly out of Scripture, but it draws from this reality, the reality that we were created by God and we will return to the ground from which we were created. What God foretells would happen in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19. That was a long time though. You look at that happened to Adam and from the time that God created him to the time where that actually happened was centuries quite literally, centuries before that happened. But it did happen. God's promises, God's prophetic foretelling came true. And it was because of the consequences of their disobedience. In the day that you eat of it, you will die. It didn't happen right immediately, but it did happen they were no longer immortal. They were subject to the reality of death. Now, that's something that we still have to wrestle with today, but it's something 
that may be like them, sometimes it feels like it's off a ways, or maybe it's not really going to happen. We're going to figure out a way to cheat death. You know, for us today, 930 years, we wouldn't know what to do with ourselves. You know, we're, we're looking to see if we can stretch another five, ten years on, on to the end of this. And, and then you start having to worry about whether it's really worth it, you know, whether uh, I, I'm not going to have those French fries now so I can live another five years in a wheelchair, <laughs> that, that kind of a thing. You have to, to weigh some of those things out in the culture that we live in today. But I would dare say that what we see people doing today, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, is a lot different than it was, say, for my grandfather's generation. My grandfather passed away of a heart attack uh, around the age of of 72, I think he was. And I remember my grandfather at that point in time. He just seemed old. He'd been retired from the paper mill for a long time. You know, after he retired, he had this chainsaw out, and he was cutting down his own firewood. But he was starting to slow down a little bit. He wasn't the same man he had been when I'd known him in my youth. Today... I get, you're 80 years old and you're the President of the United States. <laughs> uh, You've you got a lot of things that are happening. People can do a lot, whether you think he should be or not, is another thing. We won't get into that right now. But we, and that's both candidates on both sides, by the way, too. So, but there's a lot we are capable of doing uh, into long years. There's a lot people can do at 80 years old. And then some of you in the back row can testify to that. But here's the reality as well. We understand that there's coming a time where we won't be able to do what we used to do. And whether that was in calculated in years like we do today, or in centuries like they seem to. And it talks about them having more children than just the ones that were named. I can guarantee you those 80-year-old people in the back of our auditorium this morning do not want to be bringing kids to the nursery anymore. <laughs> I was talking to my sister Janetta here this morning. She's, she's wrestling with the idea of retirement, but she's also wrestling with the possibility of taking another child into her home. And she's like, Pastor, I don't want to do that. <laughs> it, it, it's, part of some, it's not something that we want to do in our later years to take on the the responsibility of a new life. Now, some of you have done that, and commendably so. And Janetta, you might end up having to do that, sister. And I know that you're willing, and that God will supply you the strength if, if that is what he calls you to do. But it's not something we relish. But that's something they were able to do here. We were operating in this period of history under different parameters, different circumstances. There's different reasons. Dr. Frisk could probably talk to you about some different theories about why uh, the quality of of physical life was different uh, back then. There's a canopy theory that happens, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that when we come to the flood. But what I want to tell you about this morning is the reality is that God gives us ultimately relief from the universality of death the death that we will all face. Why? Because it says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. That's what Adam could expect coming out of the garden because he and Eve had disobeyed God. That was the due consequences for what they had done. But the free gift of God, Paul says in Romans 6, 23, is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that reminds us of what we just observed this morning as we partook of the table. Paul puts it this way later on in 1 Corinthians 15. We read the beginning. In verse 21 he says, For as by a man, whom we've read about here in chapter 5 this morning, as by Adam came death. By a man, Jesus Christ, has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. We sang this song just before the message that was really appropriate for what we've done this morning. We will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. I will not drink of that cup till I drink of you with you in my Father's kingdom, Jesus says. Why? Not because of anything we've done, 
but because of what Jesus, as he said, that was about to do. And what we look back on as what he has given to us, forgiveness of sins, the hope of eternal life. We can cheat death, friends. Not because of anything we can do, but because of what Jesus has done for us. The wages of sin is death. Accept God's free gift. Proclaim the relief from this certainty. God brings relief from death. He brings relief from distance. As we keep reading in Genesis 5, beginning in verse 21, it talks about Enoch. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And here's the one that makes Enoch stand out from the rest. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. What does it mean that he walked with God? Well, we can look to Scripture and figure out that it means, first of all, that we walk by faith. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, that we walk by faith and not by sight. Hebrews 11 gives us specific details about Enoch when it says in verse 5, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death and he was not found because God had taken him. So that's, we'll talk about that in a moment as far as what that process looked like. But this is the thing I want to key in on here in verse, at the end of verse 5. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And How did he do that? We can look in the uh, book of Jude, and it tells us a little bit of an explanation here in Jude chapter 14. He pleased God how? It says in verse 14 of Jude, that it was also about these things that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, which by the way, why does he say, why does he have to say seventh from Adam? Because if you look in chapter 4, what do we have going on in verse 17? Do you remember who Cain's son was and what he named that city? Enoch. That's a different one. That's third from Adam. So he has to distinguish. There are two different Enochs. There's actually two different Lamechs that we read about in chapter 4 and verse 23 as opposed to chapter 5 verse 28. So there's two different people with the same names, but they are very much different people. And Enoch stands out from the other who is the son of Cain, the son of wickedness, who builds a city that opposes itself, that establishes itself in rebellion against God. And Enoch, seventh from Adam, is commended for prophesying, Jude tells us, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. I think he liked the word ungodly there. Maybe not liked it, but he understood it was important. It, was, it needed to be proclaimed. Not to condemn them, but to call them to understand what they had done and that there was a need to turn from it. There was a need to repent and look to God. Look to the truth. Find a way to get hope, to receive forgiveness. That is the reality that Enoch did, and that is why he is commended by the author of Hebrews as someone who pleased God. He pleased God because he spoke the truth, because he believed the truth. And so the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews eleven six, without faith it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Friends, that's what we need to do as well. We walk in faith, but we also walk in holiness. That we make sure that our lives line up with what God wants us to do. How God wants us to live. None of us are ever going to be perfect. David was a man whose sins certainly stand out. We know David probably for two different things. You know, he was the king. He, he killed Goliath. Maybe you could say he was a psalm writer. But 
What do we also know David for? His sin with Bathsheba, his murder of her husband Uriah, his cover-up. He stands out, and yet God calls him a man after my own heart. How can you say that about somebody who's guilty, guilty of such reprehensible, heinous acts? Not because he had a pure, unspotted, unblemished record, but because he could acknowledge these things. He could come to God in repentance and expect forgiveness. He could write the 51st Psalm. And say, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Friends, for us to walk in holiness doesn't mean that you have all these good works that outweigh your bad works. For us to walk in holiness is to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit to help us lead a new holy and, and holy life. But it is also, and it begins with the reality that we understand all of our righteousnesses, all of our good deeds, all of the things that we can bring to the table are things that God doesn't accept. The only reason he accepts us is on the merit of his son, Jesus Christ, who laid his life on the table, who broke his body, who shed his blood so that we could be forgiven. That is where holiness must start in our lives. Not perfection in moral, moral purity. It is humility in turning to God, forsaking our ungodly deeds, and letting Him cleanse us. Letting Him give us that security. And when we do that, we will walk in harmony with Him. Amos tells us famously in Amos 3.3, 3, do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet. And I believe that when it describes Enoch here as having walked with God, he was doing those three things. He believed in God. He was living a holy life. He was doing what God wanted to. And his life lined up in conjunction. It synced. It was in conformity. It was in harmony with the God who had created him. And he was proclaiming this message of escaping from destruction. You say, well, pastor, you didn't really go into detail about what happened to Enoch. We don't really know. We just know that he was and was not, he did not die. And so what did that look like? We look forward maybe as Christians to the rapture where those who are alive and remain, as 1 Thessalonians tells us, that after the dead in Christ have rise, risen first, those who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. We have the record of Elijah, that Elisha saw him get caught up in a chariot of fire and was taken into heaven. We don't know exactly what happened to Enoch, but we do know that it tells us here that he went into the presence of God in heaven. And he did not see death. He was not, for God took him. But this is the reality, friends, that we also see happening in this passage. That though God can help give relief from death and from distance, he also used people like Enoch to help proclaim the message that God brings relief from destruction. As we read there in Jude 14 and 15, he is proclaiming this message to the ungodly, that you need to repent. And he is sending that destruction. We get just a little bit of a hint of it because we know the name Noah. And Noah is the one who, as his father says, is going to bring relief out of the ground that the Lord has cursed. This one, reading from verse 29, shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Now, his father didn't anticipate everything that was going to happen, but he knew his son was going to be a bringer of hope. How was that hope going to be realized? 
it was going to be. Escaping the destruction that God was going to send. Destroying civilization. Destroying the entire world by a worldwide flood. And saving all of the people and the animals and the creatures who were inside the ark. And we'll get more into detail on that in the succeeding weeks. I promise we won't take every chapter one sermon at a time, though we're doing it this morning. But we are going to examine some of those things in detail, because that was a, a real, actual, historical event that takes place. But God, who promises, just like he did in that day, to judge the world, is also told us, as Christians, that we proclaim a message that, yes, God is going to hold our generation accountable for our deeds as well. Jesus would say when he was here on earth in Matthew 16, 27, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then what will he do? He will repay each person according to what he has done. Revelation 20 tells us at the end, at the last day, John describes it this way, I saw the dead, small and great, standing before the throne, standing before God, and books were open. Then another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And if we would keep on reading, it tells us that anyone's name not written in the book of life, what happens? They are cast into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. They will reap the consequences of their sinful actions. Friends, that doesn't need to happen. There is a way to escape that. And it is because of the grace and mercy of God that we are here to warn them of the wrath that is to come, but then to call them to escape the wrath that is coming. And you can have forgiveness. You can have freedom. You can have the hope of heaven and eternity with God because of what Jesus Christ has done. God gives relief from that destruction. And Christian, that is why we are here today, to help bring God to others, help bring that relief to others. And that comes by conformity to Christ, by fitting in with who he is and not with everybody else around us. Just like these people here in chapter 5 stood out like sore thumbs from all the people who had put themselves in rebellion, who had angled themselves and, and, and created a culture where, as it will describe in the next chapter, every man does what is right in the sight of his own eyes. There is no moral compass. There is no moral ground that is visible there. So, Christians, we will also, if we are living in conformity to Christ, stand out from the wicked world around us. How are we going to conform to Christ? Just like Enoch did. We're going to live lives of faith. We're going to prioritize God's holiness in our lives. We're going to walk in harmony with him. What does that look like for the Christian? Jesus would describe it this way in John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. That's one of the reasons, friends, we have a local church. So that we can put God's love on display, not just for the love that we show to the community, though that is something we do, but it starts with the relationships we enjoy here with each other. And it is why it is so horrific and so distracting from the truth of the gospel when we have constant conflict, when we take pot shots at each other or maybe at other local churches. Maybe you haven't noticed, Pastor John did it generally this morning, but I've been encouraging him during those pastoral prayers to single out local congregations. And so we'll pray for Calvary E Free. We'll pray for Christ's community. We'll pray for Autumn Ridge. We'll pray for people who are maybe different with us on some things, but in the essence, in the nature of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have agreement. 
We share unity. And we, friends, have to maintain that kind of a unity in our mindset. We have a loyalty here to each other. That is our primary mission, if you're a member of Calvary Baptist Church, to love, first and foremost, the other people of Calvary Baptist Church. But it doesn't, it doesn't authorize us to be hostile or competitive with another brother or sister who happens to go to a different church where they do things slightly differently if they are preaching the same truth. This is what we must do. We conform to the image of Christ and we love each other. And we can't love everybody the same way. I can't love my church, even you that God has appointed me to place uh, over and serve. I can't love you the same way I love my wife, the same way I love my family. I'm not called to do that in the same way. Now, I am called to love you, but if Andrew says, hey, you gave Reggie an allowance. Why don't I get an allowance? Well, Andrew, I'm sorry. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. I'll try to be generous. I'll try to give to you, but I don't have the same responsibility to Andrew or to John or to Sam that I have to Reggie and Caleb and Hayden and Emma. It just, that's, that's the way that it is. I love Jennifer and I love Janetta, but I don't love Janetta the same way I love Jennifer. And I hope you're not offended, sister, but that, that's just the way it works. So, we can say in that same breath, we love people at Calvary E. Free. We love people at Cornerstone. But friends, we have a primary responsibility to the men and women, the boys and girls of this congregation first. And when we do that, and we do that well, we are showing the world what it means to be followers of Jesus Christ, the benefits that they can have. Pastor John mentioned during the announcements, and we talked about it at the end of last week, we're going to have a rather unpleasant meeting, I suppose. We're going to be talking about some hard things next Sunday night. But that's because we love the people involved, because we care about the direction of their soul. And that's because we care that we have to do that. That's what love looks like. And you know that as a parent. Loving your children doesn't always mean you get to pat them on the head and commend them. Sometimes loving them means you have to make the hard decisions. You have to call them out. Conforming to Christ means that we have to do that as well. We conform to Christ. We continue our connection with him. And so what do we see from this in chapter 5 and verse 3? Adam has a son who he's created in the image of God, and he is in the likeness of God, but then it says he has a son after his own likeness, after his own image, and he names him Seth. But I believe here that just as Adam is connected to the image of God, so is he also helping him understand that the sons who came after him followed in a godly lineage, a godly awareness. And so as Christians, as we conform to Christ, we pass those truths on. What Paul would tell to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And then as he says to the Corinthians, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Just like Enoch does as well, we must count on his coming. We must anticipate that. Take the long view. The author of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 9.28. So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, like we remembered here at the communion table, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. There's a good rapture verse there for us, George. Right? He's not coming to judge. He's coming first to bring Christians home to be with him that we are not because God is going to take us perhaps just like he took Enoch that's the reality friends the reality is God is coming to judge but before he does that he's coming to give hope he's coming to give joy he's coming to reunite his children 
with their Heavenly Father, not to deal with sin. So 1 Corinthians 3.13, so that He may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all His saints. Friend, stand out from the crowd. Be godly. Show love. Proclaim Jesus Christ to the world around you. This is how Paul would put it at the conclusion or at the beginning of Romans chapter 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. Thank you, Father, for giving us your word, giving us these names, giving us this heritage that we can see. And remind us, Lord, that we too, like they did, need to stand out from the world around us, the world that has oriented itself against you. Help us, Lord, to be faithful followers, people who love Jesus Christ, as the children reminded us at the beginning of the service this morning, with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our might. As we pray in Jesus' name.